wanted to begin with a preface. I wanted to show a clip from this film of uh, Victor Renault from 1975 called Sugamin La. It's one of a handful of significant French anti-psychiatry films. This is a, in a sense, a, a, a documentary, a quasi-documentary about the practices of um, Fernand Delany, who was a ma fairly marginal figure within a number of social movements like anti-psychiatry, but was connected with uh, Guettari uh, to the extent that uh, Delany's practice revolved around creating a caravan, a traveling caravan, uh, consisting of troubled youth and children, many of whom were autistic, uh, in, in an effort to create a peripatetic cure. Uh, these were children who were deemed to be untreatable by uh, mainstream psychiatric institutions. And Delany, who passed away in 1996, had this project after he had been marginalized from mainstream clinical practice of moving around the country in a small little caravan and he would sometimes, because he was very poorly funded, he would sometimes land on the doorstep of people like Félix Guattari at the clinic La Baude where Guattari worked. Now, this particular film is not uh, situated at La Borde, and it's not the film that Delaney himself made. It's a film about uh, Delaney's time in a commune in Monoblay in rural France, a very rugged and remote region. And it, I wanted to show you a very short clip and then talk about it because I want to give you a sense of what kind of cinema I'm interested in when I talk about minor cinema. <laughs> goes to the Green. spring, source he finds the spring, this child is wandering here. He He's fascinated by it. Et nous y avons pensé, puisque d'autres, il n'y en avait pas pour lui. Comment faire pour nous faire pour à ses yeux? Juillet 1969. Il a vu arriver quelque chose. Là-haut, il y a toujours le mouvement d'horlogerie. Immuable. Tourné en rond et se balancer. La roue et l'encre. Mais. La ligne d'air, elle les prend, nos trajets, qui en sont tout irrigués. Est-ce à dire que ce gamin-là prend part à nos projets Now, the reason I wanted to show you that small clip was that Delaney is drawing some sort of representations of the area where they're living in the commune, and he's mapping the wanderings of one of the uh, 
juveniles, uh, one of the boys, who's uh, without language, uh, and mapping it in the darker lines drawn over the representation of the uh, site. And he's trying, as you can see, he's trying to understand, trying to interpret those wanderings, those lines that he wrote over in a kind of interpretation of a Qatar cartographic method, which is akin to that of Guatahi. And we can see that in this cartography of children's wanderings, intensities, the intensities of circling, the intens intensities of lines, uh, in which a subject is in this universe of reference that Delaney says is actually a universe of reference that's organized by the water course. And it's the springhead that he uncovers as the significant reference point in the wandering. So it's not an arbitrary or erratic wandering, it's a wandering that has an unconscious, as it were. This is a, one of the ways in which we can understand Guettari's interest in um, anti-psychiatric cinema. And it conforms almost perfectly to his ontology to the extent that we can see in the case of this um, boy the singularity of the existential territory that he is mapping out in terms of his wanderings. The way in which the wanderings deterritorialize the adult map of the property by creating their own passages and obeying their own interests in a sense to s discover the springhead. We see in the boy's wanderings and his activities, his pounding, his use of the rock and the stick, you know, the, the piece of wood, he's uh, chopped wood that he's pounding into the earth. The speeds and slownesses of his movements, the stopping and starting, uh, and his reference to the flux, the flux of the water is what really interests him, as Delaney says. So what is the referent here? The referent is the spring water, the activity of the stone and the wood, and the path marking. And all of these categories, the territory, the universe of reference, the flux, and the phylum, and the phylum in the case of the, the water is this sort of phylum that underwrites everything, correspond to the categories of Guattari's ontology. So I wanted to make it clear before I start that this is a didactic um, film because it, in a sense, explains what Delany's method was and gives a kind of example of it. Not all anti-psychiatric anti films or minor cinema will be this explicit about uh, the point, and Guattari is not very explicit, I'm afraid, about his interpretations of many films. He sometimes only limits, he lim limits himself sometimes to only a line about certain films, a single line, a single statement that he never elaborates upon. But I wanted to give you a sense of what some of the possible trajectories are of this approach to cinema. Now, Guattari's most sustained comments on cinema consist of only a couple of interviews and occasional pieces from the 1970s, gathered together under the title Cinema a Minor Art, strangely never translated into English that way, translated as something like desiring cine machines for some strange reason. So no one really understood that he actually had a conception of cinema as a minor art. We know he had a conception of literature as a minor art, but this is something something different. Um, cinema was, for Guattari, a privileged medium for minoritarian becomings that show a specific orientation towards the progressive goals of alternative psychiatric practices linked to multiple progressive social and political movements. If Guattari has a film theory, I think calling it a theory is, I mean, that's what I want to call it. I want him to have film theory. Uh, he doesn't have a film book, like Deleuze is a magnificent film book. If he has such a thing, 
it has two organizing principles. One, the minor is consonant with third cinema, and it has an antipsychiatric pedigree. So I want to deal with these in turn. Guattari's approach to cinema through the minor is generally consistent with Deleuze's deployment of the anti-colonialist revolutionary third cinema, which is distinguished from the first cinema of Hollywood and U.S. finance capital, and the second cinema of the auteur that is assimilable to the first cinema's industrial model. Its much vaunted independence is only a miniature version of what it seeks to escape. Third cinema is broached in terms of how it is loosened from the shackles of representation and the yardsticks of regional authenticity, irreducible to third world cinema, even though it's grounded obviously in Latin American experience and anti-colonial struggles, and even to the aspirations of national cinemas. Well, this helps to clarify the link between progressive political goals and artistic experimentation in the minor. It says little about which elements of third cinema are relevant for Guattari's minor cinema. So he did not accept wholesale the typology that you find in third cinema between uh, Hollywood, the auteur, and, and the revolutionary cinema. Indeed, although the minor is not usually affixed to oppressed minorities, this does not change the fact that many people struggling with mental illness and poverty and racism are in fact oppressed and socioeconomically and psychically ghettoized. Guattari does not conflate minor and marginal. He is not making a socio-demographic claim, although the basis to do so surely exists in many cases. Marginal is distinguished from minor in Guattari's thought inasmuch as a minority can refuse their marginality, like we find a first wave gay rights activists in the US, because it is tied to repressive recenterings on normative models, either of sexuality or lifestyle. Again, the transition from the margin to the minor may be used to describe numerous social movements that make significant gains for themselves and on this firmer ground are able to explore minoritarian and other becomings in the creation of new alliances. Guattari cites the example of the occupation of Lincoln Hospital in the New York, in the Bronx neighborhood in the summer of 1970 by the Puerto Rican group the Young Lords advocating self-determination and engaging in coordinated health activism with their allies the Black Panthers what they did was they occupied this uh, condemned hospital, which had up until that point been used as a teaching hospital for one of the universities, and they insisted upon linking their uh, housing activism with health activism and creating kind of collective values and cooperative uh, running of the hospital in which they had former drug addicts serving in the detox unit, etc., and they, they introduced the the, the, the use of acupuncture in terms of detox treatments as well. So this is, for Guattari, this is the kind of example that, that he would get very ex in, excited about and very interested in. It's not a cinematic example, as you can see. It's... Guattari did not elaborate a comprehensive theory, capital T, of the cinema. In fact, he discusses few films in depth. The few he did treat in detail tell us that his approach cannot be contained by all of the categories of the third cinema, because he mixed and matched Hollywood examples with European auteurs and critical psychiatric concepts were mixed in uh, while cleaving to some ideas of militant cinema, while implicitly criticizing the third cinema's unanalyzed pretensions to a kind of intellectual vanguard which discovers cinema's liberatory potential and demystifies it for the masses. Still, there is something of the spirit in Guattari's politics of working out the minor's connectivity in a progressivist voice. Indeed, in film's ability itself to give voices to workers themselves. But he doesn't explicitly discuss the third cinema or the films of Solanas and Gettino and how they take up, for example, Chris Marker's experiments in France to empower workers to film their own realities. Guattari is interested in how minor arts assist in connecting those not usually considered to be oppressed with subjugated groups, 
and thus defining a minor line of flight that goes somewhere and not only gets the word out but is heard and eventually brings support of people back with it. However, this doesn't reduce cinema to recruitment. For the connectivity at stake must be to the molecular features of film itself, its sounds, its colors, its rhythms, its asignifying materiality that are not bleached and not dissipated but allowed to multiply and connect and to serve as relays between hitherto non-communicating groups that have not yet found a kind of mutual understanding or mutual consistency. Of course, political consciousness raising is a basic feature of both third and minor cinema. Solidarity building is not reducible, however, to making art politically functional. Although the foundation of third cinema is the unity of politics and culture in the service, not of a passive representation of events, but activist interventions that emphasize experimentation trans and transformation of a situation, for instance, that are not readily recuperable within the terms of a dominant power's need for manageable examples of negativity adequate to its artificial reproduction. Minor cinema's affinities with third cinema need to be taken with a grain of salt. There is some continuity at the level of film praxis with a cinema without bosses, that is, of total filmmakers, as Solanus, for instance, insisted, not directors, stars, studio mandarins, and long lines of specialists, but revolutionaries prepared to tackle all of the dimensions of film production and distribution. To the extent that Guattari valorized the democratization of production and the responsible, documenta and responsible documentation, he is in line with third cinema objectives. While Solanus <coughs> theorized that third cinema could not be fictional, Guattari did not take this route. Instead, selecting from a mixture of films and styles and directors, having no compulsion about noting his favorites, David Lynch, Marco Bellocchio, among others. Terence Malick. It's quite an odd assemblage of films and directors that he's interested in. Now, Deleuzean film critics point out that the major statements of third cinema, as well as the statements by uh, Espinoza, Julio Espinoza, in Foreign and Perfect Cinema, are movements in which nomadic cinema participates not in terms of representation, but along political lines of becoming inside of colonial situations, working against mastery, towards imperfection, carving out sites of struggle whose effects make beautiful, celebratory, commercial cinema with stars in its eyes take flight, forcing it out of its self-sufficiency and narcissism. Fifteen years after publishing for an imperfect cinema, Espinoza clarified that one of the stakes of imperfection in a cinema of struggle was to find an audience not yet formed and that perhaps never will be denumerable, but will hopefully become conscious, as he put it, and participate with those who are making changes. A very Deleuzean idea then of a people to come for a cinema like third cinema, but realized only 15 years after the fact by Espinoza, one of the key figures in third cinema, because he thought we, they were merely preaching to the converted in the first place. Always changing shape, deviating, experimenting, giving the slip to dominant representations, a minoritarian audience in the spirit of Espinoza, quote, isn't the one that is participating in the changes, or isn't even potentially able to do so. It's an audience in formation that still needs to be invented, that cannot be counted nor counted on in advance, but is becoming through contact with the vital part signs of minor cinema's explorations of madness and commitment to struggle. Deleuze confronts the same problem as Espinoza. The people are missing in modern political cinema. This is political cinema's minor condition and the condition of minorities' political predicament. And the task of the filmmaker is to sow the seeds of the people to come, to prefigure a people. 
In Deleuze, the minor erases the distance between the private and the political. This is especially the case in films concerning mental health, in which the social character of illness and the state of the family is immediate. The political multiplies with the private, and peoples multiply to infinity. So the filmmaker becomes a movement amongst other movements with no unifying consciousness. Yet the prefiguration of a people is carried by the filmmaker's work which, Deleuze explains, catalyzes by expressing potential forces and collectively assembling movements. Hopefully raising the consciousness not of a unified people because a people is neither unif in a unity nor does it exist, strictly speaking. It is a multitude to come that we're talking about here. So that is the spirit of the minor and the third taken together. Now, the, the key question is, how do you minorize the cinema with reference to something I'm calling alternative or anti-psychiatric examples? How does cinema produce becomings which summon a people with whom it connects? The fundamental theoretical problem here at the heart of what it means to summon a people outside of a political or messianic telos is what do we make of Guattari's sense of a mad cinema, a cinema of psychosis, uh, an anti-psychiatric cinema. It's not a clinical, criteriological character that he's referring to. It's an exploration of all kinds of inedible becomings and transformations and molecularizations of normopathic subjects. And the interest or contagion contained in those films with respect to a people in formation that are non-specifically mad. Not in accordance with a specific model, of course, but how do they effectively get in touch with the intensities that are made available in particular cinematic works? Guattari lamented what he described as the popular taste for morbidity that brought psychiatric patients to the big screens in the early 70s, and we can think of one flew over the cuckoo's nest as a primary example. All the early, early examples in the early 60s, shock corridor, you know, this kind of stuff. Many examples. This sudden interest, a catch-22 is an example. Uh, this sudden interest in madness was for Guattari is assumable under the same impulse that made pornography and cop stories so successful. Guattari illustrated his positions on cinema with reference to selected films that transcended their overt representational content. They were not explicitly about mental illness, but showed in their very modes of expression a sensibility directly in touch with the real. This is not a matter of technical prowess, but an acute awareness of the textures, for instance, of the psychoses. Guattari discusses at length Terence Malick's Badlands from 1973 in a highly contentious interview as a film displaying the effects of mad love of Amo Fu. As he put it, the story is only there to support a schizophrenic journey. This position does not correspond with Malick's own views and, does, and flies in the face of the film's critical reception and the way in which the characters are said to be modeled on uh, children, lost children in a state of nature, uh, on the James Dean figure, so on and so forth. But Guattari rejects these kind of mimetic readings and insists that the character of Kit, which is played by actor Martin Sheen, did not evolve into madness, but was from the outset plugged into pre-personal flows of desire already stabilized in a becoming, the intensity of which could not be managed. In this respect, Kit was an abstraction from the intensities of Amor Fu, released by Holly, actress Sissy Spasik, and the film is marked by vivid asignifying part signs, which he describes as the intense blues and the bizarre behaviors of the characters, the Oh, is the crossing back and forth of borders, 
crossing over tracks all the time, all of which are in support of this schizo journey, as he calls it. Guattari does not provide very many examples, unfortunately. He does not present a full reading or an interpretation of the film, partly because he's so busy defending himself against a very unsympathetic interviewer. Still, a few of his observations are astute. The blue skies of the prairie appear throughout the film and are at times distressing in their intensity. Kit displays all sorts of bizarre behaviors, like shooting footballs and fish with his revolver, constantly collecting stones and putting them in little piles, and throwing them, sometimes at his partner, bouncing on the dead body of a cow, and taking a broken toaster with him to his hideaway in the woods, which has no electricity. Very interesting examples throughout the film. But overall, Guattari is insisting that the sense of minorization in Badlands rests on the capacity of these A-signifying part signs. Now, an A-signifying sign is a sign quite unlike a psychical sign or a Persian triadic sign. It is a sign that has no semantic content. It is in the techno-materiality of film, in a non-representational dimension of cinema, that the connection between the film and the audience in formation will take place. That is the key. So, for Guattari, commercial cinema not only serves the interests of corporate power, as a vehicle through which docile models of subjectivity are communicated by means of dominant signifying semiologies, but it can also reveal beyond its dominant features militant becomings in the socio-political effects of its technological organization. Guattari sought a direct and efficacious contact between semiotic and material fluxes in these A-signifying signs, part signs, the directness between the semiotic and material fluxes is not diverted into the sphere of representation or signification that results in their mutual cancellation. The A signifying part signs, the most deterritorialized types of signs, they're not ever fully formed because they have no semantic content, they have no psychical content, there's no signified, provide lines of escape from the snares of representation and they work things prior to representation. So that's the intense, distressing blue of the prairie, prairie sky that you see constantly in Badlands. It's this remarkable blue that's being shot. And so that's, that's the sort of signaletic, signaletic matter, to lose a Gelosian term, that Guattari is interested in. Guattari wants to outflank representation through these kinds of A-signifying part signs. And they play a very important role for him. He writes that it is equally important to underline and insist on the independent status of what he's calling a signifying semiotics. Further, quote, this will allow us to understand what permits cinema to escape from semiologies of signification and participate in collective assemblages of desire, end quote. First of all, recall that signifying semiologies are based on dominant systems of encoding, like speech, writing, nonverbal codes, and thus constitute a stable centering point for fully formed substances indexed on individuated subjects. Guattari clarifies that an A signifying part sign break the effects of this centering, thwarting the system of dominant redundancies, and accelerating the most innovative, constructive, and rhizomatic components. While signifying semiologies want to find meaning everywhere, and therein, therein refuse any independence to a signifying semiotics, which can function without them, but it can make tactical use of semiology if it needs to, Guattari resists embalming cinema in meaning. That is, embalming cinema in transcendent narratives and syntagmatic and paradigmatic chains of relations and clusters. What do they do, these 
part, si part signs. They, they trigger becomings minor in the same way thought is forced or shocked in an imminent encounter. So A signifying fragments populate the cinema as colors of non-phonic sounds, of rhythms and faciality traits, and manifold modalities and expressive matters that are open to multiple systems of external intensities. One doesn't connect with these ideologically, but rather is transported by them, moved into new universes of reference, because one's existential territory has been enriched by them. Cinema emits a signifying part signs that trigger the desire to follow their leads, but what does this mean for anti-psychiatric cinema? Cinema for Guattari intervenes directly in our relations with the external world and influence the semiotizations of viewers. Dominant values can be attacked in a variety of ways within film praxis. And he selected a number of films that he thought were magnificent, like Eraserhead, he said, was the greatest film on psychosis ever made. The other one I talk about this quite at length in the chapter on epilepsy, on uh, Marco Bellocchio's uh, Fists in the Pocket, another extraordinary film from 1965, but I won't go into detail about any of these films. His overt interest, I can say, was in a cinema of madness. And during the 60s and 70s, a number of films were produced in this sort of progressive anti-psychiatric movement that crossed genres and um, cross nations, in a, sense, in a sense. Although, I must admit, I'm only now embarking on a project to try to collect a global selection of anti-psychiatric films, which are incredibly difficult to find, let alone know precisely what the major works were, say, in Greece during this period or, or elsewhere. It's, it, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting problem. There, there's a large number of these films, but, but they're difficult to access. Obviously, um, the cinema around Artie Lang is the probably reasonably representative of the English variant of antipsychiatry. At least there are, are, are a number of uh, examples, like Peter Robinson's, Robinson's film from 1972, it's called, it's called Asylum. Um, the European examples that really impressed him from the early 1970s uh, and were aligned with the European network of alternatives to psychiatry in which he participated include a, a work called Fou et Délier, a Fit to be Untied, um, which is a March 11th collective, an Italian anti-psychiatric cinema, uh, work, of, work of Italian anti-psychiatric cinema that he talks about at length and that, that he was very impressed with this film. It inaugurates for Guettari minor cinema itself. So minor cinema is, it has a, a point of origin in a sense with this film and yet it does not, it's not exhausted. The question of origin is not exhausted by this film, although it's, it's very impressive for Guettari. Basically what this film shows is um, uh, uh, the way in which anti-psychiatric uh, struggles in Italy connected with the workers' movement to the extent that they uh, many um, mentally ill uh, outpatients were situated in factories in a kind of ergotherapeutics that allowed them to, to participate in a kind of collective life in that factory and also make a living, and otherwise it be, would be impossible for them to do so. Guattari was very impressed during 1974 when he saw this, but then later he said, well, it's somewhat naive you know, to think that this is really a solution, but nonetheless, there, there's a current there that he thought was very significant, that, that if we could relate this if we, if we could produce more examples like this, if we could find more examples like this, of cooperative sort of transversal connections between progressive social movements that sometimes didn't work or didn't even exist, and that the cinema could help create those connections, then we would be on the road to something like a minor cinema that was a vibrant minor cinema that had real social impact.
But the documentary, for instance, Asylum, undoubtedly impressed Guattari because of the intimacies of the household dramas it revealed in true verite style, right down to the exposed microphones, in the context of Lang's post-Kinsley Hall experiments in community care, which was Archway House in London. The commitment of the filmmakers was evident inasmuch as they stayed in the therapy community for six weeks during the filming. And over this period, they not only recorded, but played active roles in the group problem-solving sessions. So the, this is the key, one of the key features of, of, uh, of minor cinema, the Guettari and all of his examples, whether they're the Japanese examples or English examples, and there's a few of them in his, in his work, the filmmakers are actively involved in the community that they're working with, and they play significant roles for fairly long periods of time. And in the, in the Japanese example that he uses of um, an attempt to organize the exploited workers in, a, in, in the area of Sanya in Tokyo, which is uh, a very poor uh, area where um, kind of migrant labor is exploited by the mafia, by Yaku Yakuza, filmmakers who tried to who lived there to make a documentary about this phenomena and why the police are complicit in the exploitation of this particular stratum of Japanese society, um, they were killed by the accuser. And Guattari uh, went to kind of lay a wreath there when he visited Japan as a kind of homage to the filmmakers who were killed. And in fact, not only the original filmmaker was killed, but the replacement director was also killed. And so he thought, this is a cinema commitment which is directly engaged in the life of the community and that this kind of thing would have impressed him in asylum. That they're part of the problem-solving activity of the group, the filmmaking filmmakers. So the community itself was questioning what a community was, what a family could be, struggling with its own alternative modelizations through the episodes of its key denizens. I don't know if anyone knows this, this film. Again, Fouadelier, made by Bellocchio and some of his colleagues in Parma, Italy, about a psychiatric hospital in Parma, focuses primarily on the youth and the women in the film because they're recounting of the experiences of psychiatric, psychiatric repression in the hospital and triumphs in everyday life on the outside are the most moving. But he also notes, as I mentioned, how the labor activists have come to integrate these ex-patients into their political projects. And so, although it's somewhat idealistic, these experiments, he was still hopeful that despite the changes in the workplace and in production, computerization, and with robotics, the, the uh, possibility of integrating these uh, patients was diminished. Nonetheless, this militantism of everyday life constitutes for him a way forward. Guettari's minor cinema is catalyzed by what he refers to as the psychotic multiplicities of dispersion that you can see at work in, in David Lynch's Eraserhead. So you see that he is lurching in a way from this well-grounded political cinema in Europe to this more um, phantasmatic construction of a schizo process in which we find um, the character Henry Spencer's molecularizations, the way in which the eraser, the eraser shavings in uh, eraser head, uh, represent this psychosis, this psychotic multiplicity, and uh, how the character passes through uh, into different dimensions of reality through his radiator and back and forth in his room, and the way that he works with a whole series of worms. Uh, dancing worms and keeps them in boxes and a mound, mounds of dirt and so forth. This, the delirium is expressed in all these subterranean passages and the orbit around the planet that he takes regularly. Um, so I guess the lesson here for Guattari is that you can't divide minor cinema 
into cinemas that display either worker struggles or explore madness in documentary or fictional forms. Like uh, Deleuze, Guattari sees political film's task in terms of the multiplication of connections among disparate fragments between anti-psychiatric struggles and the labor movement, between the family not as a domain of containable private problems, but already as a social and political entity. At the core of Guattari's minor cinema is the idea that cinematic investigations of everyday struggles precipitate changes in those hitherto removed from them, removing the distance that separates private from political, issue from issue, and the many ways problems are swept from view and being compartmentalized. A couple of closing remarks then. Another anti-psychiatric film that caught his attention was René Ferré's Story of Paul, the Histoire de Paul, from 1974. Foucault has written about this quite elegantly, this film as well. Using professional actors in an asylum setting, the effect is realistic, almost documentary-like, but causes a double take. This is how Foucault reacted, by rubbing his eyes and saying, those are actors, not psychiatric inmates. Yet the setting is not like an asylum, it is an asylum. Everything orbits around a patient named Paul, and how he's swallowed up by the institution, and how he, in turn, ingests the institution. The effect that Ferré sought was based on playing mad by the rules of the asylum in order to better show their effects. The film illustrates that minor cinema is not dominated by one genre, but crosses and mixes and confounds its expectations. What Guettari wanted to be understood by minor cinema was its ability to promote, through a signifying part signs, and ethically responsible film praxis, the release of becomings minor in the mass, or at least precipitate a move towards this utopian goal that he shared with Espinoza, the means to which were otherwise insisted in dominant models, meanings, and beholden to many contingencies and false immutabilities for closing them. By promoting the release of creative potentialities, by extracting and loosening them, Guattari hoped they would mutate in a way that would allow them to emerge as components in new auto-modelizations of subjectivity, open to establishing existential coordinates that include the ethical-political imperatives of an engagement with madness and poverty, as well as following forward the references they trigger intimately and in terms of potential praxis. European anti-psychiatry movements were dominated by leading radical psychiatrists and theorists whose ability to speak in the language of Foucault's history of madness appropriated for anti-psychiatry when it was originally published in 1961, often took precedence over making concrete interventions. A sophisticated social realist work on schizophrenia like Ken Loach's Family Life from 1971 was brilliant, Guattari thought, on exploring the contrast between progressive small group therapy within a hospital devoted to sedation and electroshock and the production of case histories, but still short on concrete reforms. According to Guettari, it, not, it was not accompanied by a single concrete proposition for reforming the situation. That's a pretty good assessment of that early Loach work. Guettari makes no mention of classic anti-psychiatric documentaries such as Frederick Wiseman's reality fiction about the conditions in the state prison for the criminally insane in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, the Titicut Follies of 1967. However, popular works like these held promise because of the potential publics they catalyzed, which Guattari hoped would make new demands on the dominant commercial film industry to deliver radically different kinds of messages.